Welcome to Prestasia Conversations. I'm your host, Noah Berlatsky, and this week I'm thrilled to have here with us Andrew Perry. Andrew is America's leading authority on the arousal response and sexualized violence and related taboo topics in the sexual assault field. He is the founder and director of Sexual Assault Awareness, and he's also a psychotherapist with over 20 years experience treating sexual assault survivors. So thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, Noah. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Prostasia uh, since discovering them well, maybe a year or two ago. Um, and I don't know if that was uh, Jeremy's posts on Twitter, but I just started noticing them on Twitter and then following them. And uh, it was such a different kind of conversation than I typically see in my field. Um, and it was really nice for them to very scientifically, intellectually separate out a lot of issues that people tend to conflate, which is one of the struggles I have in a lot of the work that I do. So I can really uh, both empathize and relate with that. Well, thank you. Could could you talk a little about how you ended up in this field? Like what read, led you to start researching, writing about the experience of people who experience sexual arousal during or after sexual assault? Right. Well, those are two different questions, how I ended up in the field and how I ended up doing what I do. Uh -huh. um, but I, I'll say very briefly, um, my very first client ever, ever, when I was a very young intern, uh, and this was at the LA Free Clinic, was a young woman uh, who had come in originally because she was struggling with um, coming out um, as a lesbian. Um, and she had told a couple of friends, but she hadn't come out to her family and she wanted some support around that. But in uh, doing our therapy together, uh, what came out is that at 11 or 12 years old, she had been sexually assaulted. And that became one of the themes that we worked on. And I fortunately had a very good supervisor because at that point I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and those were some pretty heavy themes for a, you know, I had a lot of education, but not application at that time. Um, so I was running back and forth to my supervisor between sessions and getting support on where to take things and what to do. But by the end of our work together, we had actually largely resolved a lot of that. And she told me something that really shaped what happened over the years. And she said, you're really good at this. You're really good at talking to women. Uh, and you, you were really helpful for me in uncovering these issues. And she knew I was an intern and she said, this might be, uh, I forget how she worded it, but some, you know, uh, a career path for you to think about or, you know, something like that. And of course, you know, I was, I was young and I was new and it was very uh, rewarding to hear that kind of thing. But it really did shape and fit with a lot of who I was at that time in terms of my uh, stance on feminism and patriarchy and supporting women in the world and that kind of thing. Uh, and I hadn't yet determined kind of where that was going to take me. And I did a number of things over the years, uh, but eventually, you know, a number of years, a couple of decades ago, uh, found my way back to doing the sexual assault work. Um, and for many, many years, I, I did that, I think, as many trauma therapists do, sexual assault recovery specialists do. So um, again, this is a, a number of years ago um, and I had made, I had an assumption because I had been working with clients for a long time and arousal was an issue that came up from time to time. And looking back now, I think it was my I don't know how to put this, my lack of knowledge at knowing that that wasn't something that was commonly discussed in the field. So I was commonly discussing it and I would raise it with my clients and it would be, you know, an issue and we would process that along with other things. And I remember talking to a female colleague again, you know, a number of years ago uh, about a struggle one of my clients was having uh, and arousal was one of her issues, but it wasn't the issue that I was bringing up. But in the context of consulting on this case, I mentioned that and she said, oh, well, that's the issue at a, at a deep psychological level. Uh, she's carrying a lot of guilt because she really wanted it to happen. And that kind of like, no, that's not what's going on. It's, it's this other thing. But it kind of blew my mind that that was a response I got from someone in the field who does the work I do. And it kind of sent me on this journey going back into all of the books and all of the texts that I had written, or re I'm sorry, read rather, um, where I thought arousal as part of sexual assault was pretty common knowledge. And what I discovered was it absolutely wasn't. It was barely talked about in the field. Like some of the classic texts that I had been trained on maybe had a line in an entire book saying that, oh, th this is something that might happen anyway, and then go on with, you know, other things. Um, so it sent me on this deep dive and realizing this is not something that is commonly talked about in the profession. It's commonly known 
by survivors, certainly. And it's kind of anecdotally known, I think, by people who do the work I do, but it's not really talked about. I had never been to a training uh, with all the trainings I had been to where that was really talked about. And so I kind of took a leap and I went on to the social media website. This is about 10 years ago now. Uh, Reddit, if you're familiar with Reddit. And I did this whole post basically uh, on a rape recovery forum saying, uh, this is you know my specialty, this is what I do, and this is some of the things I encounter. And I just wanna have a discussion with people about arousal in the context of sexual assault because it's a thing that happens and it blew up, it became huge. As far as I was told, it was like one of the biggest conversations, uh, you know, certainly on that topic, uh, but I think in general, uh, in Reddit at that time, it was like one of the top 300 conversations of all time or something, and I got all these guilds and awards and things. But, uh, but what came out of that was I started getting invited to conferences and to speak about my work. Um, and so I started, you know, doing more research, developing more, and I traveled the world and I did all of these talks and conferences about arousal and sexual assault and, uh, brain development and hormonal response and evolutionary response. And, you know, I can, I can go into some of that. Um, but that was kind of where that piece came from. And it's more commonly talked about now. I'm not necessarily attributing that to myself, but, uh, yeah, you know, there, there was a number of articles I saw after those Reddit conversations that sort of would indirectly quote things that I had said in there. So I knew where they had come from. I started seeing mentions on like TV shows like Law and Order and things like that. Again, I'm not claiming credit, but it was just the timing. It was interesting, I thought. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned yeah. that um, you said your colleague said, you know, oh, well this person must have been aroused because they wanted to be sexually assaulted. Right. Um, and you said, that's just not what's happening. So okay, right. could you talk about what, what is happening? I mean, it sounds like this is a common experience that people have is that, and so, so what, what causes that? Uh, I simply put, it's a physiological response. There is stimulation happening to a very sensitive part of the body. Um, and that combined with fear um, sets off this whole trigger of hormonal and physiological reactions that result in arousal and orgasm for, uh, you know, we don't know exactly the percentage, but I'm gonna say somewhere around a third. Um, and I think a lot of it is very context dependent. One of the things that I've found is that when there is more buildup um, I use kind of the classic scenario of the girl trapped at a frat party, surrounded by guys, and she knows what's going to happen. And there's like, they're saying things to her and it's kind of building up much more likely for there to be an arousal response than kind of the uh, the sudden forceful violent attack. Um, and also typically the less violence, the more um, reactive the woman or man uh maybe not that it doesn't also happen during violent attacks it does but there there is a difference there um but there really was no research on this and no studies on this and um just now i actually had a grad student a couple of years ago who saw me speak at a conference and she made that the subject of her phd dissertation so we now have as of one year ago the first qualified data saying not only that this is a thing that happens, but we have some pretty good data saying how often it happens, some of the context, uh, how it creates inhibition in disclosures uh, to therapists, to uh, certainly to reporting to long host of other things that it affects, being able to disclose to partners and so forth, uh, because it does add this whole other level of shame, because even though we may know that it's physiological to that individual who thinks this is only her that's going through it and doesn't realize that it, it does carry a lot of that uh, sense of I wanted this or I'm a slut, I'm a whore, something's wrong with me, I'm sick, I got off on you know, all of those kind of distorted beliefs that come up around that. And people aren't necessarily, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, if you're saying your colleagues sort of, you know, thought that this meant that right. they wanted, I mean, people aren't necessarily, they're not wrong to be nervous about disclosing, right? Because people are very, there's a lot of stigma, even Absolutely. among partners and, and even among therapists, it sounds like. Yeah. No, I mean, certainly in the lay public, there is. 
Um, but yeah, when I, you know, I've done uh, presentations in front of, you know, rooms full with uh, therapists, police officers, uh, you know, lawyers, et cetera. I talk at, you know, uh, uh, feminism and crime conferences and various things. And yeah, it's, it's amazing to me sometimes where I see the nodding heads and where I see the looks of confusion. Um, or even, you know, I've also had accusations like, you know, how dare you say these things? You're a monster. You're insinuating that, you know, women are getting off on rate, you know, all of this stuff. Um, and then I just point back to my PowerPoint and I'm like, that's, if you were listening to me, that's not at all what I was saying. Um, the group, the professional group that more often than not really gets it are sane nurses, uh, sexual assault trained nurses, because they are trained in the human body and physiology. And when I've done talks with nurses, that's where I really see that. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. Even if they weren't aware of it, it makes sense to them and, and it fits for them. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've presented some pretty high level psychology conferences and I'm, I always walk away a little bit surprised. Um, uh, although I've had some really good, um, you know, feedback, uh, for the work that I do. Um, I had, uh, an experience, this is a, a number of years ago, the president of a psychology organization that I presented, I came up afterwards and he said, I saw your talk. I really liked it. Um, but you know, evolutionarily, you know, modern man is all the descendant of rapists and rape victims because that's what sex was. 100,000, 300,000, a million years ago. And that kind of set me back. And then I started thinking about it more. I was like, yeah, there, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. And there's scientific support for that as well. Because one of the differences we see, because I'm often asked, well, what about men? Yes, men do also uh, experience arousal and orgasm, but there's differences between men and women. And one of the differences is that women will physiologically respond to a much wider set of sexual cues than men will. And one of the theories around that, and that that's, you know, uh, had some, some validation through research, is that uh, for the exact reason I'm talking about, that in a pre-antibiotic world uh, where, you know, tears, injuries that could occur through an unwanted sexual event where there was no lubrication would result in death for the woman and obviously no offspring, so no survival of the fittest and all of that. So a woman who was able to lubricate uh, and become aroused in the context of a sexual threat was much more likely to live through it, much more likely to bear offspring, much more likely to survive the attack, go, you know, go on and, uh, and from there. So there, there is some evolutionary support to that theory and that idea. Is, I mean, one of the other things you talk about in some of your work is, so there's, there's, this fact that people sometimes experience arousal during a sexual assault, but there's also the issue of, you know, sometimes people have have fantasies about being raped and right. that those can sort of interact with the actual experience of sexual assault in kind of different ways, which can be, you know, well, I mean, one way is that people feel feel more guilty, right, if they've had these kinds of fantasies Absolutely. and... People I'm smiling a little bit because we're sort of diving into the, the part two of my work. Uh, okay. I sometimes think it's it's not enough for me to set myself up in this niche area where I'm, you know, sometimes praised, but sometimes uh, vilified for what I do. I have to make it worse by going into these these other areas, because when I see something that isn't reflected in the literature and that nobody's talking about that's happening with a lot of women, certainly, you know, with my clients, I need to look into it. Uh, you know, that's just kind of, you know, that's the researcher in me. Uh, I am, I am more psychotherapist than I am researcher, but there is that, you know, part that's like, okay, this, this is happening. And if it happens with one person must be happening with others. So I guess you're saying that you've had some success in sort of helping people sort of like, um, heal from sexual assault by yeah. by sort of doing by having these sort of basically BDSM guided therapeutic. Well, yeah, I want to be clear. It's, you know, very new. You know, this is just mm -hmm. a methodology I've developed over the last several years. I've presented it. I've gotten a lot of um, 
I tend to get more positive feedback from the kink uh, psychotherapists okay. uh, than the the gen. I have not presented this at a general psych conference yet. Uh, part of that has been my own concern, which is why I so much appreciate uh, you know, shows like yours willing to talk to me uh, about my theories and ideas. But for people who are um, psychotherapists that are also knowledgeable about BDSM, not that that's a large pool, but they do exist and there's several organizations um, that do research around that. They very much understood these concepts um, and uh, you know, much more receptive to them and, and, and even, you know, added additional information that was helpful for me in developing my, uh, my theories and my, uh, my methodology. As far as actual application, that's kind of where I'm at now. I have a, a few clients who uh, have found out about me and know the work I do, referred to me by someone else. Um, and we are working through using that methodology um, and so far so good. Um, and really it's an advanced form of exposure therapy, which is a lot of what I use, you know, kind of traditionally with my sexual assault clients, uh, and very simply, uh, exposure therapy is taking the person back to that time, having them go through verbally the experience, uh, along with the emotions and thoughts that go with it. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, a verbal talking through of what happened and it's very successful, has a lot of positive elements. This obviously adds a whole other huge layer because it's a physical reenactment of what happened. And so what I have seen and what's been reported to me is that the timeline of being able to work through these things, even though it's more impacting, is also a lot faster. Um, that realizations and aha moments and you know things to be able to bring back into therapy and talk about happen at a much more rapid rate after an enactment uh, than you know, the months and months of working through exposure therapy in a, in a talking way. So, so what do these enactments look like? I mean, are there sort of, are they doing it at home with a partner? Is it, you know, that's a really excellent question because it goes into a lot of other pieces. Um, generally, yes, to what you're saying. So, uh, we discuss, um, the actual experience that happened. We discuss what I call trauma points or trauma moments, meaning, uh, very simply, like, what, what are the emotional, uh, wh where's the emotional weight for you now in what happened with you? Is it a image? Is it a memory? Is it a smell? Is it a sound? Is it a position that you were held in? Is it something that was said? Like, what are those things that still, you know, weigh you down? Um, and then we build those into a scenario. And a scenario could be a complete recreation of what happened, or it could just be elements you know, uh, it's like, okay, these two or three pieces that I want to make sure, you know, get get designed into the role play, but it doesn't have to be a full recreation of everything that happens. So it really depends on the person. Um, but as far as who plays the role of the perpetrator, it's a huge question mark. Um, as you probably know, in the U.S., certainly, uh, you know, different in other countries, uh, the concept of sexual surrogacy is illegal. We do have trained sexual surrogates, people who are trained to be able to uh, physically interact and enact with people. But in America, it's considered a form of prostitution. So it's this very, I don't know how familiar you are with sexual surrogacy, and I, I don't have to do a whole talk about that, but it's a thing that exists. Um, so for a lot of women, they'll say, well, I want to do these enactments, but I don't want to do it with my boyfriend and my husband because... I don't want to put him in that position. I don't want to make him feel like he's harming me, or I don't want to taint the relationship we have, which is very loving. And, and even though I'm struggling with, you know, being able to enjoy myself sexually with him because of these barriers, I don't want to bring that into the relationship. So what do I do? So we have these, you know, conversations about, you know, uh, what, what's the ability, if it's a polyamorous relationship, it's a little easier, you know, non-monogamous relationship, easier to have those conversations, you know, harder to do that, obviously, in a monogamous relationship or where she's, you know, I don't want, I don't want him to think I'm cheating on him and that kind of thing. Um, so in, you know, in those cases, we either have to keep talking and thinking about how to make it work, or we have to get to a point where she can be open to bringing that other partner in and having a more open discussion with him about what this could look like and what role he could play. So it gets, it gets kind of dicey. Uh, and that's, and that's a very common question when I do presentations, one of the you know things that come up, actually I get one of two questions, which is, are you doing the enactments? 
uh, which I say, no, I'm the therapist. So I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not in the room. I'm uh, not taking on the role of perpetrator. Uh, I am, I'm the therapist uh, helping you coordinate behind the scenes. Uh, so just in case that's a question for your audience. And then the other is uh, who do I find to do this? Um, for single women, a lot easier. Uh, because there are dominance in the BDSM world. And, and I would, I'm not saying like go out and find someone uh, because there's a lot of bad actors out there. There's a lot of dominants who think they know what they're doing and don't. Uh, one of the things I've been asked to do is to develop a training for dominance around this. I have not oh, done wow. that to date. Um, I've had a few dominants approach me and I've given them some, you know, thoughts and tips and ideas and, um, but yeah, um, you know, there are dominants who, you know, would be very well qualified to be able to do this. Uh, and then there's also a lot of scary people out there. So it's, it's hard for me, uh, to, you know, tell a woman, well, yeah, just, just go to your local munch and ask around and you'll, you'll find someone. Um, uh, cause that's, that's not, you know, a terribly safe idea. What is a healthy outcome here? Like, I mean, is it, is it, you know, I presume it's not necessarily no longer having rape fantasies, but. Well, it can go in one of a couple directions, but I will quote uh, a woman I interviewed who said it suddenly felt like the fact that I had been raped wasn't a big deal anymore. That was her revelation uh, coming out of an enactment was it was this huge relief, this huge release. Um, and this sense that what she had been through, she had still been through, but it was more of a bad memory than a present trauma. Uh, and that's, a, that's a concept I use with my clients, uh, in general anyway, with, you know, exposure therapy or whatever I'm using is, you know, the goal of treatment is to move this from a present nightmare to a past bad memory of a thing that happened that, that time or those times, whatever the context was. Um, so I've had women approach me who say, I feel ashamed, dirty, disgusting. I don't want to enjoy these things. I don't want to engage with this anymore. And I have other women who will say, I'm afraid to go to therapy because I'm really enjoying this. I'm afraid if I work through it, I won't have the same level of arousal and enjoyment that I do and do it. So, you know, obviously two very different things. And my response is, I don't necessarily know what the outcome will be. What I do know is that this won't impact you the way that it currently does. And my experience is that when we work through this, it often frees them up to make that choice. So some women do find it doesn't have the same impact it did, which is what I wanted and I can move on. I can enjoy more vanilla sex or I can enjoy other kinds of things with my husband, boyfriend, dates, whatever. Um, and other women find that the trauma and the horror of it don't live with them anymore, but they're now freed up to enjoy the pieces that they enjoyed about it. I'm curious, is, is it, more, is there a sort of a, sort of a trend you've noticed in terms of, are the people who you work with, like, have they often had, um, sexual violence in childhood? Is it generally like more adult experiences? Is there, is it's it both? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly worked with, um, uh, women who were molested as very young girls, uh, uh, you know, had rape or sexual abuse as teenagers, um, and then on into adulthood. What I have found though, is that, and I'm not saying this is a rule because it isn't, um, but that post pubertal events seem to um, lead to more desire for these reenactments um, where where I, I say, you know, not not necessarily is for very young children when there's a lot of grooming involved and a lot of arousal involved. Um, and it wasn't, uh, you know, again, just sort of a, either a, a one off experience or uh, or, you know, very violent and unwanted where there is that, you know, that serious grooming that happens, you do tend to see more of that, uh, the desire for reenactment as well. Um, I was going to go all the way back to your first question about rape fantasies, because I always like to throw this out because people, you know, when you talk about rape fantasies, uh, people get very uncomfortable and, oh, no, that's not something a you know, woman wants to fantasize about. Um, 
And yet I remind people that the largest subset of uh, romantic fiction in the world, certainly in the U.S., is kind of what used to be called bodice rippers uh, you know, back a uh, hundred years ago. But it's the Harlequin romance, which has very rapey themes. If you just pick up a Harlequin romance book and read through it, it's full of uh, the woman who uh, hates her, whatever, this guy she meets. And then he pushes her against the wall and kisses her. And then she's angry about it. But then she falls in love with him. And it's like that theme repeated over and over and over. And there's always a, you know, a sex scene in there that that starts off with kind of this you know, fight unwanted element and then turns into, oh, my God, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. Orgasms for I think there's actually less of that in romance. I mean, I read romances um, and there's I mean, you know, there's it's it's a huge thing. So there's definitely some of that. But I think it's maybe less um, sort of the central thing than it that it used to be because people, you know, people have concerns. <laughs> Yeah, but there's yeah. still there's still definitely like you know. But I, but the interest is there. You know, there was there okay. was a study um, just a couple of years ago that around violent pornography, and this made sense to me because I deal with this issue with my clients all the time. That found that uh, women were at least as likely as men, if not more so, to do searches on violent pornography. And if we're talking about the experience of validation and universalization that am I alone in the world? Do other people understand my experience? A lot of girls who have had sexual trauma go online looking for images, pictures, videos of things that look like what they've been through. And that's a very common experience for for a lot of girls. And then a lot of shame, you know, uh, attended to that as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us again. Um, I hope I haven't freaked out your audience too much. (laughs) Hope not. I mean, I was going to say, you know, this is the sort of thing we talk about here. So, um, and just we're one of the few organizations dedicated to discussing and raising awareness around topics like this. So um, if you found this helpful, um, please consider donating so we can continue to do this work. And thank you again for, for appearing with us. And I, you know, last comment, if um, you know anyone listening to this would like to contact me or uh, is being you know uh, either you know triggered or needing to talk about things that are coming up for them, uh, you know I am open. I take on new clients all the time, um, so feel free to reach out to me. All right, thanks again. Mm-hmm.